Welcome to another one of our sci-fi flicks at the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. I'm Sheldon Brown, the director of the Clark Center. And um, uh, tonight we're going to watch Gattaca. And the program is, if you've been at some of these others, some of you have, and, and a lot of you haven't, because we have this contingent of students here that uh, came from uh, Grossmont, uh, or Sweetwater High School District is something, is, is, that, is that right? Sweetwater, yes. Go Sweetwater. <laughs> and, and so what we're, what we're going to do tonight is we'll talk a, just a little bit before the movie begins about some of the kind of ideas and themes in the movie. And, um, and then we'll watch the movie, and then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. The students all have gotten uh, index cards, and if you've come up with a question, uh, you know, we'll pick up those index cards, and, and, um, and the conversation afterwards will be moderated by uh, Dr. Asha Sagan, who's one of the cognitive scientists here at UC San Diego. Um, uh, and as always, I need to make sure that I thank um, the people that have helped make these events happen. Uh, our, our, the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation, who awarded us the Center for Human Imagination here at UCSD. Um, Viasat, who's our, our founding corporate sponsor. Um, our Founders Orbit patrons, and our Stardust Nebula patrons. And, uh, and you're all welcome to be part of those prestigious groups. And just go to our website and and look up how you can help uh, the Clark Center continue to do these kinds of things as well as our other research programs. Um, so now what I, I, I want to just say a couple of words about Gattaca and, and why it's such an interesting movie for us. And it's just going to be a, a minute or two here. But, but it's, I think it's a good example of one of the things that we look to in our science fiction, whether our movies and our books, um, that where we look at how there are these potentially very disruptive scientific and technological endeavors that, uh, that we're exploring, that we're creating right now. And the, sci and the science fiction helps us to think not, not only about those specific uh, technological and scientific discoveries, but also their second, third, and fourth order effects as they end up becoming a part of our social and cultural makeup. They, they change the ways in which we actually live in the world and the ways in which we actually think of who we are as humans. Um, now, this movie was made in the mid-late 90s when we were really uh, understanding how to sequence the human genome. So the Human Genome Project was, had a, had a, had a, was up and running, and um, it was a very exciting time as we speculated what would be the outcome if we were able to, sp to understand the genetic makeup of, of, the, of the human being at, at its most fundamental level of detail? How, would, how might that change who we think of, who we are as humans? Um, and what might that mean to kind of those, some of these eternal questions that humanity is always asking about the relationship between uh, fate, destiny, and our own self-determination? Um, fundamentally coming down to the question of who are we really. So this movie tonight, I think, really starts to tease through some of those questions in a really fascinating and interesting way. And so, so now what I want to do is introduce uh, the Dean of Biological Sciences, Bill McGinnis, who's going to set up a little bit more of what we're going to do tonight. Hi, my name's uh, Bill McGinnis, and um, one of the reasons that we're really interested in helping develop this program is to um, contrast science fiction with science and to introduce those who are very interested in both science fiction as science, as I have been for the past 30-some years, uh, and how those uh, tensions inform us and how they dilute us to some extent. Um, and uh, today we're very lucky to have this movie which has been 
developed and uh, brought by Sheldon and his uh, company in the Arthur C. Clarke Center. And we're very happy to be a partner with them. And one of the people who's very generously supported this uh, endeavor has been Don Yeckel, uh, who's one of the uh, supporters, the founder, the director of the Ray Thomas Edwards Foundation, Don. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who's particularly interested in uh, bringing high school students into UCSD to uh, expose them to both UCSD science and um, the role of academics here. So today we're very lucky to have both Larry Goldstein and Shanti Ganesh to discuss and probe the meaning of the film that we're gonna see tonight, which Sheldon has introduced. I've known Larry for about 30 years or so. He was a professor at Harvard, um, and he's been a longtime geneticist, and um, I won't go into his long history, if you don't mind, Larry. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, at the moment, he's the director of the Stem Cell Center, there's a long name for it here, but he's the director of the Stem Cell Center at UCSD. And he's had an enormous public impact on the interaction between genetics, stem cells, and society uh, in San Diego and beyond. And our other discussant tonight is gonna to be Shanti Ganesh, who's a postdoctoral scholar at the moment at, at UC Berkeley. And she's been concentrating for a long time on the interaction between um, our representation as avatars and um, scientific uh, representation of, uh, Shanti, you're gonna have to explain this better than I, but uh, <laughs> artificial agents at some level, sometime, perhaps we will, um, be able to present ourselves as avatars in uh, gaming situations, perhaps understand more about ourselves. I look forward to that. So um, anyway, Shanti will introduce herself, and I think she and Larry are going to start off briefly uh, before the film, and I'll let them do their thing. Thank Bill for keeping that blessedly short. Um, so I really only want to take two or three minutes at the beginning here. And what I want to do is just tell you briefly what, which of the technologies that you'll see portrayed in this film are reasonable with today's understanding, which are a reach, and that way you can sort of know what you can take for granted. Because the most interesting aspect of this film ultimately is thinking about how is technology used? And how do we decide what uses to make of technology? Uh, because there's some very disturbing questions raised in this film, I think. So two, two relevant technologies in this movie are, one, the use of DNA typing to determine an individual's identity or who was, as we say, at the scene of a crime. And as you know, that technology is in routine use now in law enforcement to try to figure out who is at the scene of a murder or who handled a murder weapon or what have you. And indeed, you'll see the use of DNA typing technology in this movie. It takes advantage of the fact that each one of us has different unique patterns in our DNA, our hereditary material. And it is very straightforward now to take a drop of blood or a bit of skin or a few hairs and determine whether the DNA in those materials are identical to somebody that you have uh, information about in a database say. We can do it now uh, routinely in, I'd say, six to eight hours uh, is pretty reasonable with today's technology. You'll see it done in the movie in a few seconds, but I think that it's not that far off to get to the point where it is reasonable to do that in a few seconds. So that's one technology you'll see. The second technology, a much more problematic one, is modifying the human embryo so that you can obtain desired characteristics 
or remove undesirable characteristics in uh, a baby and person in the next generation. And I can tell you from experience that if you were a mouse, we can do this very easily, extremely easily. We can't always make the mouse behave better uh, or have a better form and function. That's the part that's a little dicey with this technology. Um, but we can certainly make it worse and we can certainly change the genes in the mouse and control them and do all sorts of interesting things. In humans, it is completely feasible to do this kind of genetic engineering of the human embryo, but with many of the same fears that we don't know how to make things better with current technology. We're pretty good probably at making them worse. To be honest, many of the experiments to develop that technology are probably, in my view at least, in and of themselves unethical. If you think about testing whether you've made a human embryo better or worse, who's the uh, participant in the experiment, if you think about it, is the interesting question. Uh, but that technology is absolutely within our grasp uh, at this point. But the question is, you know, can it be applied, should it be applied, and how will it be applied in the future? And that's the other set of questions this film raises. So, Shanti. Thank you. So <clears throat> in the late 18th century, there was um, a British uh, scholar, a theorist, who came up with the idea, who designed actually a new kind of prison. And the prison that he designed is called the Panopticon. And the way it's designed is that it's basically it's a circular building with in the middle a watchtower. And he designed it as a tool to regulate human behavior or the behavior of the prisoners without having to uh, use um, torture or you know, violence. And how it worked is that here in the middle is a watchtower with a watchman and around it are the cells and every cell is one inmate. And the person who is in the watchtower, in the central tower, he can see everything, but he himself cannot be seen by the inmates. Whereas in the peripheric ring, which is the circle, everyone who is in the circle, or in, in, the, in the cell, can at any time be totally seen, uh, but they cannot see each other, and they cannot see the watchman. And the idea is that just the very fact that there is a chance that you can be seen, that at any point this beam of light can be aimed at your cell, just the awareness of that chance alone is going to regulate your behavior. You're going to behave in a way that when the light is shine on you, that you will not be punished. And about two centuries later, there was a French philosopher called Michel Foucault who said, well, actually, this idea of the panopticon, pan means all, and opticon refers to seeing, so seeing everything, this idea actually also applies to the society, the society after industrialization. And in such a way that our behavior can be, is regulated in such a way that we are constantly being seen and you can maybe relate it to when you're on the internet, you can be followed, your behavior on the internet can be followed. And he said, well, actually, in, in, so not only in the prison, but actually in society as a whole, we are aware that whatever we do, we can be at any point be seen. We don't know by whom. For example, the CCTV cameras in England, we don't know who is watching us. But just the awareness of that we can be watched is going to regulate our behavior as citizens as well. And this is called the society of the spectacle. And but this visibility, this, this constant chance of being seen in our behavior is actually a trap. 
And uh, another uh, French philosopher, you could say, called Guy Debord, um, wrote a book about it and called Society, The Society of the Spectacle. And I want to give you two quotes from that book. Uh, one is that he says, all that once was directly lived has now become mere representation. And the other thing that he says, the spectacle is not just a collection of images, rather it's a social relationship between people that is mediated by images. And of course, he wrote that in 1967, and now you know, we have Facebook to as, as a very good illustration of that. And what I would like to, to bring here is that these images by which our social relationships are mediated are no longer just the images as you post them on Facebook, for example, but they can also be the images of what is happening inside of our body. So it's not just our photographs or our behavior that are the representation of who we are, but increasingly so what is happening inside of our body, inside of our biology. And the question then arises, um, who, who are you? Are you your representation, your profile, whether that's your behavior uh, or your photographs or your, you know, the, the reading out of what's happening inside of you? Or are you some, someone else? Is there like uh, an original and, and a copy? And I find it interesting that Guy Debord was able to imagine that there was once a directly lived self and a representation. And what I would like to ask you, since we're here at the Center for Human Imagination, is to try to imagine a world beyond this spectacle of representation. Can you, can you even imagine, especially um, people, young people who were born in this age where the spectacle has been so advanced already, you grew up or you were born in an age where there was already internet and mobile phones and all of that. What, what does it take to even begin to imagine this world where there was, an there was an original that was not a representation in the way that I just described? So having said that, um, I would like to, to leave it at that and um, wish you a happy viewing and would love to discuss further after the movie. Thank you. Okay, I uh, hope you enjoyed the movie. Um, we're going to take questions from the audience. So if you have, have not uh, passed um, questions, but you have some questions you'd like to ask, it's not too late. Laura can uh, pick up your cards, and I will uh, hope to address uh, all of them as much as I can read. Um, so it would be interesting to um, get different takes on the, on the same kinds of questions, both in terms of the biology as well as the um, implications of, on society. Uh, our first question is actually uh, most li uh, likely um, a biological question. Is it really possible to determine a person's lifespan from their genetic code? Well, so first of all, I, I do think I'm qualified to say something about society here. I do remember being a citizen and all. But that's oh, I did not mean <laughs> that you uh, I didn't check that at the door <laughs> at <laughs> <No>. all. <laughs> just just com combating the myth about scientists. Uh, <laughs> so I think I, I think the real answer is at the moment we cannot adequately predict human lifespan from uh, a person's genetic code. It's possible that one at some point might be able to determine total lifetime risk for various diseases and things like that. But let's be realistic. Nothing can predict whether I'm going to step in front of a car <laughs> or my lifestyle or anything uh, else that might affect that. So a little far-fetched, I think, ultimately. Yeah. So let me um, maybe expand on that a little bit. Uh, I mean, there's a long-standing debate both in, in science as well as in philosophy about how much of inheritance or how much of, of 
uh, of our traits are inherited versus learned. And I guess recent research in, in your field has been showing that even our genome isn't as static as we thought, mm -hmm. uh, that the expression of those genes is much more dynamic and can depend on input, not only input, but also even our mother's lifestyle or um, stress levels. So does that make everything a lot more complicated than um, initially thought when this movie was made? So, so what, what Aisha is asking about is a, an area called epigenetics, where the sequence of the DNA itself determines part of how the DNA is expressed in the form and function of the resulting organism, but there is also long-term environmental effects on the way the DNA is expressed and read. And uh, some of the interesting studies have suggested that the stress level of a mother during pregnancy will have an effect perhaps on the gene expression patterns in the offspring that are lasting throughout the life. So yes, that makes it more complicated, I guess you'd say. Uh, probably makes it more interesting uh, as well. And you know, ultimately there is this deeper question that I think you're driving at that a film like this drives at, you know, to what extent do we accept that everything that's relevant about us is simply our genetic makeup? You know, is there, is there really free will or not? I happen to be a big believer in free will. Uh, and uh, there's a lot more to risk of disease or disorder or accident or fate or behavior or life than is coded in our genes probably. I suppose it's possible I'm wrong about that, but it seems like such a dull possibility. <laughs> Did you have, yeah. Yes, I, I would like to add to that, uh, actually, that I think an underlying question is also, to what extent do we want to um, uh, let our choices uh, in life depend on chance calculations? So do you see, uh, do you see life as, uh, as a, uh, you know, is the goal to reduce risks? Do you see life as a, as a chance calculation or do you see life as an unfolding process? And I think that that w became very clear here in this movie. So genes, so gen genetic predictions is one, but you, you also see it uh, in your daily life, like when people apply for a job or a school, um, they say, well, I'm not gonna apply for this job because what's, what are the chances that I will get it? Um, and that's it, actually quite a fundamental question when it comes to imagination and creativity, because for those processes to happen, um, you also need people who are willing to be non-conformative, who are willing to be recalcitrant. And so free will um, is, is, um, is related to uh, also being able to say no to a profile that's being imposed onto you. And so I thought that was very <coughs> nicely illustrated in this movie. Yeah. Thank you. This is actually a related question. Um, can you determine personality from a genetic code? Um, it is obviously related, but I guess um, uh, disease risks is uh, one thing that we know, at least in some cases, to be uh, heritable. Um, what, is our, what is the state of the uh, research at the moment, something like personality? Yeah, so um, it's an interesting question because on the one hand, obviously, I think you'd say personality is shaped in many ways by your experience in your life and how did your parents treat you or what kind of experiences did you have in playgrounds when you were a kid. Um, on the other hand, there are aspects of personality that do seem to have strong genetic influences. And maybe the, the best example of that, well, some of the examples that are coming from recent studies of what we call psychiatric disease, where there's a great deal of evidence that there's a strong genetic risk for the development of bipolar disorder, uh, other psychiatric diseases such as schizophrenia, and even autism, uh, which is uh, as much as 1% of the population by some uh, estimates. Um, you know, interestingly, it seems to me, y you have to look at the question in a slightly different way, which is, uh, 
yes, genetics expresses itself and has an impact on disease risk. Uh, and at the end of the day, it, it seems that a different way to think about it is that genetics creates a great deal of diversity in our capacities that are then acted on by the environment in interesting ways. Um, and in fact, what, uh, and this is perhaps a bit of a relativistic statement, but what we call disease in modern society in a different kind of environment may have been, you know, mainstream uh, middle age behavior. So uh, I think it's, it, it's, diversity is a very important part of what organisms seem to have. It allows them to survive in different environments. We're selected to have a lot of different diversity. Some of it may be partly uh, read out in personality, but there's also a great deal of environmental influence on these things as well, as a film like this, uh, you know, argues very persuasively. You know, what do you, how do you measure determination and will? That's a, that's a tough one. Oh, and also cultural uh, variability in these yep. things. Did yep. you have um, something to add about this, Shanti? Yes, uh, I have something to add about it. So in the Netherlands, which is where I'm from, uh, there's, um, there, there are a lot of uh, migrants, as there are, are here as well. And uh, one, one su such group are the Moroccan uh, people who came uh, as uh, guest laborers, we call them in Holland, in the 60s. And recently there was uh, research that, that, that showed that um, there's upward mobility in the, in the newer generations. But th it showed that the, the Moroccan uh, young professionals who were living in the white neighborhoods, so to call, had a higher chance of being schizophrenic or, g or getting schizophrenia. So that, that raises a lot of questions like how, how about the interplay between environment, culture, and genetics. Mm. And also, um, uh, the, the I exactly what, what you say, there is, there's, um, maybe there is a function for diversity. Um, I think I read a, a while ago that um, a lot of genius scientists or genius people, they either have someone in their family who, who had uh, schizophrenia or uh, they had some, some uh, psychosis uh, themselves. So it, it, it to, to say that you want to uh, eliminate uh, all those diseases from, to, from happening um, may, may not be so straight, it's maybe it's not so straightforward the relation between uh, disorders or personality disorders and, and talents. Actually, I have a bunch of questions that are related to this general theme of diversity, so maybe we can continue a little bit more about this, if, you, um, if you're okay. Um, both biologically and culturally and socially as humans, but other organisms as well, um, my understanding of biology is that it, it, for evolution to work and, and be creative, so to speak, it needs a little room. Uh, we can't, sim I mean, reducing genetic diversity would seem to influence, would, would, could possibly have a sort of an avalanche type of effect. Um, are there examples of this sort of thing uh, that we already know that restricting the um, diversity of a, of a species can have uh, negative effects uh, for, in unintended ways, in, in the biological sense, and, uh, and also uh, as you touched upon, uh, is it a good thing for, for the species uh, as a society for humans? Well, I, let's see. So that's several questions rolled yeah, into one. <laughs> um, so, so I think, you know, statement number one is you cannot have evolution without mechanisms that generate diversity. You have to have mutation and natural selection or you can't get changes in form and function over long periods of time. Uh, whether any organism has yet been documented to have what you might call sort of minimal or low diversity generating potential, uh, there are a couple out there. Uh, Bill's probably going to remember the name of this beast better than I am. What was the one that Matt Meselson was working on there for a while? It was one of these organisms that uh, the, the claim was it had no sex. So sex has been, a, has been one of these areas of diversity generation that's been argued a lot about whether it generates diversity at a rate sufficient to put new combinations together that can be selected for, or does it actually break up advantageous combinations more quickly? Ah, rotifers. So there's a kind of rotifer that apparently doesn't have sex. And, you know, the question is, can you have an organism that only works off of mutation and, and how, 
board selection and, and so forth. So uh, I don't know that Matt ever, uh, ever answered the question. Uh, there's a fellow I knew back at Harvard. He's the guy who did the heavy light DNA labeling when he was a youngster. Um, but it's a very interesting question. It's not settled in evolutionary biology as far as I know. There do appear to be organisms that, to my eye at least, have a great deal of diversity generation inherently. I think the one I would pinpoint are dogs where I don't know of a single other species that has anywhere near the malleability of uh, dogs to be uh, bred for incredibly uh, uh, strong heritable characteristics with an enormous range in size and shape and everything else. There's speculation that that's related to mechanisms that generate diversity at a higher rate, but it's, as far as I know, it's not a settled question by any means. But it's an interesting possibility in dogs in particular. Um, to you both, as a, as, a, as a society, as you touched upon, um, if we were to sort of try to reduce incidences of bipolar disorder, depression, and uh, all these things that can really be uh, difficult for, for patients to deal with and can legitimately at some point be argued are things we should try to uh, cure, uh, could there be a risk of, of um, reducing the kind of diversity that we might need for new avenues of thought or, or creat creative uh, directions um, to occur, or possibly for sad love songs and depressing <laughs> poetry and to be written? Um, <laughs> Yes, that's the nearsighted argument. Right? <laughs> yeah. If we, if we, if we uh, but beyond that, um, made people who were nearsighted unable to breed, uh, that would be, uh, you know, not so right. good from my point of view. <laughs> I, I might win. Yeah, I might win that one. <laughs> minus eleven. Uh, I can't see anything. So, um, do you have anything to uh, expand upon that, Shanti? Maybe that you touched upon the schizophrenia thing. Um, yes, I do, but I. I Maybe we can. Come again, to it's one of these issues that you don't really know. You know, when you talk about the origins of human creativity, it seems to me that we don't really understand it. You know, there are examples of, for example, the mathematician who is the subject of the the book *A Beautiful Mind*. Um, one of his friends, those of you who've read it may or may not remember, there's a passage in there where one of his friends is asking him, you know, you're hearing voices. Why can't you ignore what the voices are telling you? And uh, I don't know if you all remember this, but the reply was his mathematical insights were coming from the same places as the voices. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't, right. he didn't know how to tune one out and not the other in a way, which I thought was a really remarkable idea that, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe this, uh, this edges of you know, mental capacity and personality really is part of diversity generation in thought, and that's a good thing. Um, although, when you get to the question of should society regulate who breeds and in what capacity, I personally have problems with that. Uh, right. So. Yeah, I can uh, I can say something also about the creativity because there's um, it's it's actually not known. Um, uh, there's this <clears throat> idea that schizophrenia or bipolar disorders uh, are related to creativity, and, and then the famous example is. Of course, Vincent van, van Gogh. Um, but th that relationship is very unclear and it's not been uh, settled. And there's also the question, uh, why is it really true that you really need to be really sad and depressed and to create um, beautiful art? And that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's I think very much under debate also. Right, I didn't mean to imply that it was necessary. Well, There's this uh, that picture it's of the it's, it's tortured artist. No, <laughs> it, it is actually a, a, a discussion in the field of creativity research. Is there a cons or something resembling a consensus, or is there just sort of very different types of art creation, possibly a diversity, so to speak? Uh, well, I was um, at w n n I was at in in Heidelberg in Germany uh, once for a conference about um, uh, coherence and discoherence of the self, and it was uh, near uh, the psychiatric uh, institution had a museum uh, where they had uh, all the art that was created by the patients in uh, in a creative therapy, and they had an exhibition of it, 
And it was a, a very uh, intricate work. Uh, and and uh, walking through uh, the exhibition, uh, I also got a very eerie feeling uh, because w one thing that was lacking in my, from my point of view was the kind of uh, innocent playfulness, uh, goofiness that, that you would see in, in like when children uh, create th things. So that kind of prompted me to study uh, the relationship between playfulness and creativity <laughs> and how to distinguish between the, you know, the creativity that's made uh, by psychiatric patients or the art that's made by psychiatric patients and people who are very happy and, and, then, and then are creating music or painting. Yeah, it's sort of an interesting argument, but you could turn it around and argue that in order for somebody to be accepted in a given community, you know, if you're, that's the way to, you might think about it. You could imagine that the artistic community might be more accepting of people which have very different ways mm -hmm. of thinking, such yeah. as you would find in what we call mental illness, whereas, you know, the nine to five steel worker, you know, there's not much room for that kind of uh, mental illness or creativity, and so you tend to select for people being in professions that they have ability for or where they're socially accepted. And it's not necessarily because they have an ability that nobody else does, but it's because there's a society that can accept them. Mm -hmm. It's an argument that's sometimes made about scientists. You know, one of the <laughs> myths about scientists is that we're all these borderline autistics, um, and you know, we have personality disorders, and you can't talk to us, and we only come out at night and all that stuff. <laughs> And, I do. And, <laughs> and you know, I, I'd say that my experience is you do not have to be a weird personality to be a terrific scientist, um, but that, that the, scientific, the scientific and academic community is more tolerant, in my experience, of some of these unusual personalities. I don't think it's a prerequisite for entry. Definitely not. Self-serving statement, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Eccentrics, I think. Eccentrics, yes. Both artists and scientists. <laughs> I have a, um, let me try to rephrase um, this as clearly as I can. Um, in terms of the technology, today uh, we already have, at uh, the beginning of the movie, when they are sort of, uh, have those embryos and they're talking about uh, that how they have sort of made the perfect embryos. Today we're not there yet, but as you, you uh, mentioned at the very start, that isn't um, you know, out, of the, out of the question to happen. But today we already have uh, the pre-implantation genetic mm -hmm. diagnosis or screening that uh, couples who might have a, a heritable condition who want to have children. I mean, this, this can be a, a absolutely positively helpful uh, use of this technology say to avoid something like Huntington's disease or an 80% probability of Parkinson's disease. So as mentioned, for most disorders, the predictive power are not so great, but there are a few genes that we know that are associated with very high probabilities. So it does make sense to help those individuals to not pass on those traits to their children. On the other hand, you have this kind of idea of well, let's have hazel eyes, or let's have one green, one blue eye. Where do we draw the line? Uh, and, and in the middle, I, I know people doing gender balancing. So they have three uh, daughters and they want a son, or they have four sons and they want a daughter. So that seems to be an okay uh, application of the technology today. I'm just wondering, where or how we might want to draw the line or who draws the line in such cases? Well, that's always the question. So I think if you examine the, the statements you just made, even the question of is it okay to remove an embryo that has a 100% chance of developing into a person with Huntington's disease, or let's even make it worse, a child who will die in the first year of life. Is it okay to not allow that embryo to implant and to remove it from the population? There are members of American society and worldwide society who would say that is not permissible under any circumstances, no matter how severe the disorder. It's one great mm -hmm. extreme, and then you have probably another extreme who would say, well, it's okay to pick eye color and pick hair color and pick skin color and pick intelligence if you knew how to do it, which I don't think we do. Uh, and then you have everything in between. And so the question really is, how does the society make decisions like that? And, you know, 
personal bias, obviously, is that democracy is the only thing we've got that is even remotely able to grapple with situations like that in a way that is uh, at least palatable in some sense, and we vote. And I think uh, I'm not prepared to have anybody impose those decisions from above. I don't think there should be a single authority who says where the line gets drawn. But it does bring up very, uh, a great many uncomfortable questions about how does one draw the line, who draws it, how much of the technology should you understand, are experts the only one allowed to have a vote in that, or mm. should everybody have a vote in a pluralistic society? They're hard questions about the nature of decision making in pluralistic societies. Um, but I'd argue that at the end of the day, it's better than all the al alternatives that we have. That would be if you if you uh, compare democracy to to other kinds of uh, societies. But even within democracy, uh, within different democracies across the world, there is a difference in in how privilege is distributed. And um, I read uh, a, an, an article um, by uh, activists in India who say that uh, there's a you know in India there's a preference. Uh, I'm generalizing now, but there seems to be a preference for male babies o over female babies. And um, that is actually the rich people who have access to that technology, they are actually perpetuating that preference and using modern technology to do that. So um, so it, democracy, yes, I think is, is kind of a prerequisite. But then within that, there are, there are so many complex interactions between culture, technology, and privilege that, that come into play. And it, it seems, it, it, when I think about it, I th it's like, how are we ever going to solve that? Hmm. I didn't say the answer was easy. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, but I it's think like it's a really tough question. Yeah. And of course, it's not only in this area where one confronts that kind of issue. Yeah. It, it, you confront it every time you think about the uses of technology. Mm -hmm. you know, it gets into this question of, is the ability to select for children of a particular sex so inherently evil that we never want to develop that kind of technology? Yeah. Or is it the use of a kind of that kind of technology that we want to regulate? And you still get back to the question of who decides. Uh, on that note, actually, well, we already have, as far as I understand in China, some millions of, of uh, extra male uh, <laughs> humans than female uh, humans that accumulated. Uh, given China's population, it's it's not a small number. Uh, this is through the use of non-high tech uh, selection of what's considered to be a privileged gender. So if we w um, so this, I'm going to get into hard hard questions because I have some here hard. more hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> so in this film, we see uh, that the privileges of that of today, such as um, gender or race, um, have been transformed into this genetic privilege. You know, you have a good DNA score of various, however they measure it. And it, it, I found it quite fascinating that in parallel that they had diversity uh, based on the factors that we consider diversity today. So they had Asian, black uh, individuals who were successful and also uh, not successful in, in underclass or the privileged class in that society. We know, of course, that biological evolution can happen much slower scale than cultural evolution, but cultural evolution still takes time. So even if we were to somehow top down have this possibility of testing the DNA and getting a measure, it seemed to me the most sci-fi part of the movie was that we would lose what came before, that suddenly it wouldn't matter what color your skin was. Um, I, I just could imagine people going to the doctor and saying, well, if we really do want to give our child the best start, isn't it true that we have some racism in this world, so wouldn't you want to uh, sort of minimize that? Um, it seems like there would be a transition period at least, or is it ever realistic to think that we would lose our historical baggage of, of uh, privileges that 
we've lived with uh, for a really long time. Is that? Yeah, I think it's very interesting how you make the distinction between genetic evolution and, and cultural evolution or behavioral evolution. And I'm not sure if you can really distinguish those two in, in that sense. Um, because, yeah, the, it, it's like um, going back to the previous question, like how, how we decide uh, what is allowed and not. It's, it's always, it always goes together. Mm. No, I, I guess I'd, I'd look at it slightly differently. Um, I think you could make a strong argument that culture evolves much, much more rapidly than uh, organismal species evolution happens. Um, if you were to, if you were able to do the experiment of breeding a present day human with a human from 10, 20, 30,000 years ago, I suspect they would interbreed quite freely if yeah. you could set the experiment up. But the cultures would be unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. I mean, totally different, the value, you know, what somebody would regard as attractive or would skin color matter at all to somebody from 30,000 years ago. But so I, I think maybe it's not so unrealistic to imagine that we could learn to be colorblind in the next 50 to 70 or however many years with this, uh, this time period happens over. You do see hints of it happening, I think. You know, you look at my kids' schools and neighborhoods. They're not colorblind yet, but it's changing pretty rapidly as I see them interact with their peers and kids who look all sorts of different ways on their soccer teams and basketball teams. And um, I think there's hope for that. I hope you're right. <laughs> One last um, question that I uh, comes to the idea of, of surveillance and privacy that you touched upon. So in this film, um, we see that this aspect has extended on a very routine basis, just like you might get pulled over and hand over your driver's license. You are asked to hand over your biological data. Um, and, and in some sense, um, I, I think that a lot of us have a lot of uh, sort of fear or apprehension about such a situation. But um, of course, my understanding here is based on a, a, a book that's uh, not necessarily you know, a, si a popular science book, but uh, I read a book called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, mm -hmm. the HeLa cells. <laughs> and it, it's a fascinating book for, for, for many reasons, but basically cells that are used in every biology lab today were, were derived from this one woman, Henrietta Lacks. And it, through reading that book, there's multi-layers of the story. But one thing that I learned is that our the family of this woman finds out about this and they have a very complex relationship to this idea that their mother's uh, cells are duplicated billions, trillions of times and, and they, they didn't know about it and they're like, shouldn't we get paid for this? So many complicated things. But one thing that I learned was surprising to me is all of our tissues, if, if you've been to hospital any time at all and given blood, uh, urine, what, what have you, that is considered abandoned... Uh, tissue and, and you don't really own it anymore. So we are already giving away, I mean, there's all this concern about privacy, yet at the same time, we've all given away our, our data already. Is this, um, <laughs> I, uh, uh, is this going to really turn into a, a, a use uh, such as Google uses our browsing behavior to direct ads towards us? Will they also be using our um, genetic data, is this a real possibility, you think? Well, I know from the Neuroscience Institute where I worked in the Netherlands that, uh, and I'm sure it's, it also happens here, that insurance companies ha seem to have a lot of interest in genetic studies and uh, in, in genetic neuro Im neuroimaging uh, studies. So I think we're definitely moving in that direction. And I also think that the, that the calibration is changing, like how we are, uh, um, as we're dealing with these questions, uh, we're also shifting towards, it seems, more ease. Uh, just look at the way um, Facebook works and, and the privacy there. And when I was doing my uh, PhD, doing neuroimaging, I would always give um, a CD with the anatomical image to, my st to the students who participated. And I always said to them, treat it as your medical file. Because you know, it's very rare that you're 20 and you get a brain image. Uh, of it's like it's like a baseline measure of, of, of your brain and I said but treat it as your medical file and keep it uh, you know in a safe place and a lot of them just posted as their Facebook <laughs> profile picture which is like 
uh, you know, to me, that that's like, uh, whoa, that that's big. But for for the generation that's growing up with all these images, apparently, it's it's easier to share that. Well, that was what we saw enacted in the movie, right? Your DNA sequence determines whether you're eligible to date Uma Thurman, right? <laughs> so, uh, or Ethan Hawke, apparently. Um, but, but I think, you know, it's, so I think the good news is there is actually developing legislation in the United States. There is something called the Genetic Privacy and Non-Discrimination Act, mm -hmm. which forbids um, discrimination against people in federal hiring, based on genetic information. And I think that's the right kind of trend. And in fact, it is ultimately getting at this question of shared risk. I mean, I think I'd argue if, if you really knew everything about everybody's genome, you'd find that we all have lots of risks for lots of things. And really, the only way to manage that as a society is just to share the risk across the board and not get so worked up about whether you know, we have a slightly greater chance of developing this disease or that disease. Last time I looked, nobody's immortal. <laughs> uh, you know, there are differences in degree, apparently, and, you know, obviously there are extremes that one wants to, to be cautious about. But I think it's the right trend. Um, I think that if you look at the current trend in genomic studies, it's, it's unlikely that there will be any real privacy in the coming years about an individual's unique genetic type. If for no other reason than if I sequenced a few of your children, I could pretty much deduce what mom and dad look like and vice versa. And so there's a great deal of information to be gleaned about any one of us just from sequencing our relatives. And there is no way to require that I have to give permission for my relative to be sequenced today. So I think we're, we are looking ahead to a time where this information will become probably available in ways we're not yet comfortable with, mm -hmm. but that the solution is to enforce non-discrimination. I mean, what they said at the beginning of this film, in fact, was there were laws forbidding genetic discrimination, mm -hmm, yeah. but nobody paid attention. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. And that is like past situations with discrimination in the United States. There were laws, but people still discriminate. You have mm -hmm. to overcome social behavior yeah. in order for law to be meaningful. I think that we are uh, out of time, and I've gone through your questions. I would like sure. to thank our panelists thank for you. participating. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming and uh, seeing the examples of how science fiction helps us think forward here. So come back. We'll have more films coming up in the next uh, few weeks and months, and uh, enjoyed having you here.